And again, happy to chat on LinkedIn or online. Any further questions other than what's come up today? And the presentation deck, once we've completed the four weeks, the knowledge area, the, the DMMA, we will just get everything ready and publish it on request, uh, the, the, the entire series for your use. OK, next. Let's see what's up. OK, our, our events. Uh, this is also published on LinkedIn, so if you haven't seen it, please take note of it. Every week you can see jam packed with with uh, with 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 webinars and uh, learning opportunities. So please look at those. If you haven't joined um, Meetup yet, Meetup is a great tool. You get notified for every time we uh, we, we we schedule a, an event and you can just automatically get it into your diary. So please go to Meetup, check out the 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 events there as well and uh, and LinkedIn as well. We keep posting the same uh, diary, and so you keep everybody informed. So thanks for that. And also on Fridays, remember ten o'clock, we have our uh, CDMP Q and A for anybody wanting to know about the the CDMP process, how to get registered, how to get going, etc. So thanks for that. Having a look there. Then also what's coming up, our training events. We're very excited. We will. We, we we are excited for completing our first data management for certification this year. Thanks to Veronica and the cohort that, that joined her this last week. I can see from all the comments on Teams and the feedback emails, it was a great success. So thank you for that. Uh, next week, very excited as well. We we kick off with how to plan data. That's our data architecture course. And, um, you know, high level outcomes of that is is preparation for the for the exam, CDM, the the CDMP uh, architecture exam, plus job readiness, and you uh, you'll be you'll be treated with a number of uh, case a case study. Uh, there's working templates, no, lots of how tos going on next week. So, looking forward to that. And then two weeks later, we have our also our our kickoff of our how to analyze data. That includes data warehouse and BI, plus big data and data science in terms of the knowledge areas in the DMBOK. And again, uh, exam pre preparation and job readiness is, are the keys there. So please uh, have a look at those, get hold of me or Howard or anybody on the team, and we'll quickly get you signed up if, you, if you're interested and you can make it. Um, March, uh, you can see the analyze flows into March, the first week of March there. And then we have again, uh, data management for certification. Just a reminder that we do every second uh, week of every month for the year. That's just a mixed class and we run. We also do spe special classes for different uh, needs. Uh, we do, there's a handful of banks that we handle their training and we sometimes set up a, 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 a separate training, not a mixed class for that business if, if, if it makes sense in terms of numbers. But otherwise, please join the mixed classes. Uh, they're great fun. Lots of learning and interaction between different industries, et cetera. And then uh, the first week of March as well, we we have a, a repeat of our How to Govern Data course. Also a fantastic course. I've been involved with that one. And also loads of learning there, preparation for the exam. Again, case study, job readiness, practice, and, um, and lots of grilling from Howard. So it's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> so great. Awesome. Thanks again, everybody, and uh, enjoy the enjoy the session. I'm watching the um, there is a the first question. If everybody, I can see eight responses so far. Um, we've got about 22 people, including myself, Howard, uh, on on the call right now. So please, if you can log on to uh, menti uh, www.menti.com using code 64951826, please add your answer there. There's two questions, and then I'll. Um, Go to the next slide once that's done and watch the interaction on either Menti or the chat. And I'll, as I said, I'll add those those comments from the chat into Menti as well. Cool. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Howard. Over to you. Excellent. Paul, thank you very much. Um, appreciate that. And, and so this week is the one for the data citizens. Um, I'm, I'm doing something slightly different today in terms of not going to go through all of the essential concepts. Just trying to reduce the number of slides and the number of times we go through it, but there are some points that that I'll bring to light um, in that situation now. So this was almost the first uh, thing that we need to discuss, and and I'm glad you've got some uh, comments and some feedback, um, and I, I'm glad they're also in agreement with what 
what I feel. So the first thing is, is um, must the data citizens complete the maturity assessment? Yes, definitely. Uh, I, I feel that it's important for the business to give us feedback. So if everything about data management is demonstrating business value uh, and improving what the business get out of data, then surely they, they've got to give us the feedback. Now, I'm certainly not saying that technical people are not involved, but if we're going to go to this level of automation and, and constant assessment, then we've got to get the data citizens ready. We've got to get them engaged and we've got to get them answering the questions. Now, one of the things that I'm finding quite often, and, and I'm, I know Johan's just left, so I... I was going to use him as an example, but I'd love to get some other people's feedback is initially, I almost find that there is no ways that the data citizens are capable of doing the maturity assessment. And maybe I should I should give you, and, and again, I, I believe it's just a maturity thing. I don't think they, they are incapable of doing it once we give them the right education, but we, we've got to train them. Now, uh, the example I'm going to use and take you through uh, to prove my point is data architecture. So we want, for example, our business people and our data citizens to assess how well we're doing at data architecture. And I'm sure you'll ask the question is like, well, one of their first deliverables is an enterprise data model. And the questions come very quick and fast to say, what have I got to do with uh, producing a enterprise data model? Um, why, what is what I even care about it? And, and I think that's the question I find a lot of times where, and, and also in governance, when you look at, oh, how do we establish an operating plan or a data strategy or a, an operating model or a people assessment? What has it got to do with the data citizen? And, and that's the point that I'm, I'm, I'm wanting to bring through here in terms of how do we deal with these questions? And Johan, <clears throat> gave an example just before where he went, he had an assessment with the executives and asked them about the different knowledge areas and asked them more from a qualitative point of view. So there weren't any fixed uh, questions and elements like that. So there would be almost how do you feel about our maturity with respect to data architecture? Now, for them to be able to answer these questions, they, they need to get an understanding of, well, what is data architecture all about? And maybe before I go on, is, is there anyone else that has tried to uh, perform one of these maturity assessments with the executives or with their business units and ask them to complete the assessment on data architecture? Is there, has anyone done that? And I'd love to know what your results have been. Anyone been successful? And if you were, um, Paul, I think if we go to the next slide, uh, there may be questions and answers on there, um, or we can get it in the chat. Or anyone like to just comment on it? Any anybody anybody done a uh, an assessment on data architecture for a business with executives or data citizens, and how did you handle it? I would, if you wouldn't mind just hitting, you've got presenter rights. If you could just hit the button so it can go to the next slide on Menti and. I, I've just done that. Um, so cool. I'm on the next slide. Cool, thank you. Okay, great. Nothing, com nothing coming through yet, so. No one, no one coming through. So has no, one, has no one asked data citizens to assess data architecture? Paul, I know you had a had an engagement with with Hollard. Um, yeah, and and did did you deal with this aspect, or did they? How, how did they feel about assessing? Was it a technical person that assessed? It was more the technical team that got involved. Um, yeah. So yeah, just to this point, I think it was limited to what the results were doing and saying, but that was the focus for them was under, making sure that the technical team was or establishing the maturity level of the technical teams by those those different the three different businesses okay okay all right um so no no other comments so let me let me just go through this uh and sort of explain 
a little bit of a background in terms of, again, this comes from the previous essential concepts. What is what is DMMA all about? Data management, maturity assessment. Uh, why do we do it? Well, we, we're trying to assess the current state so that we can get better. We're trying to understand the challenges that they have. Um, these things can be done at different times. And of course, this is a way, say, where does it happen? Well, I certainly believe it happens at the corporate level. It happens at a business unit level. It happens almost at, uh, if you're an umbrella unit, then it would happen at the reporting entities. And then when I say enabling units, it could be happening, for example, with the BI team or the data architecture team. Uh, who should be doing it? The business stakeholders. Um, that's sort of what we refer to as our data citizens. And then we'll go through the scope of, of this type of uh, assessment. Okay. So Sorry, Howard, somebody commented, we did a maturity assessment, but more aligned to process and data movement than architecture. Okay. So, okay, okay. So, uh, am I just correct in, in saying there then that the, the alignment would be something like a, a, a business process, for example, data quality or, or metadata or document and content, and not so much from a data architecture point of view? Is that, is that correct? Okay. Maybe not to to get held up. I, I think we'll sort of get the, the the feedback a little bit later. So when when we take that architecture and, and we break it up into and if we're assessing the maturity, we break it up into certain components. So what are the dimensions of this assessment? What is the scale that we use? And I think most people use almost between a, a one and five. Um, I know that I'm I'm. Uh, sort of using uh, a zero as well, and I'll, and I'll share that with you. What is the statement of work or, or the scope that we're going to operate? And then what type of assessment are you doing? Are you doing a maturity assessment? Are you doing a risk assessment? Are you doing a cultural assessment? And then are you doing a change readiness assessment? So when you're preparing for these assessments and, and you're going to get people to interact with them, this needs to be well defined and almost by all your knowledge areas. OK, so if I look at data architecture, um, that's the area over here. These are the dimensions. And notice that within that, we'll have to look at the technology side. So for example, the data storage and operations, the, the different areas that we have, the technology that we have as part of, of that data architecture is involved with. It also looks at the data itself uh, in that scenario. And yeah, that's data architecture. Sorry, it was the wrong way around. Um, and then the last one would be these related capabilities. So for example, what is my risk assessment uh, if we don't have the appropriate deliverables for data architecture? Or what's my process quality like uh, with data architecture? Or how well are we creating value with data architecture? So all of these related capabilities, each each knowledge area should be um, commenting on and, and assessing their value of these components. OK, so just back to the maturity levels, just as assessment, I see level zero as the capability doesn't exist. Um, if you're in a small company and you haven't done any data architecture, well, you, you may not have any of this stuff in your in your business. Um, or you may not want to, you decide that you, you're not interested in it. But then I'm, as, I'm assuming if you're not interested, then you probably wouldn't be doing an assessment on it. You'd probably make it out of scope. Um, and so those are the different levels, and we'll move along those later on. So just to look at a structure of a maturity model. So what we, what we do have is these maturity models. These are the different levels from one to five. And within each different level, we have the different process areas. We then have uh, processes within that process area and then deliverables that are created. OK, so this is the way I see it. We have a level zero to five on the maturity. We have the activity phases, um, so planning, development, control and operations. Um, and th again, this is a mapping to the DMBOC. Please note that if it's DCAM, this may be slightly different, but all of them should have the structure. 
Okay. Um, and then we have processes. Now, in my processes, what I like to assess from a maturity point of view is not just the process itself, but also the deliverable. Uh, sometimes we just focus on the process and then we miss the deliverable. And, and, I'll, and I'll show you now why I, I feel it's important to work with both. Um, then, then we have, when we take our business processes and, and, and all our data management processes and we break them into goals, practices, this is what I refer to as a practice definition. So have we defined the practice definition for data architecture? Um, and when you define it, you'll, you'll set up the goals and you'll set up the way of work. This is how we do things. Okay, so that's that's what we're trying to understand when we do an assessment is have all these things been defined and are we clear about it? Okay, so data architecture statement of work or what's our scope for the DMBOK? When I use the DMBOK as a framework, I believe it's the context diagram. Okay, so the scope of data architecture assessment would be assessing how well we're doing according to the context diagram. And I break it up into uh, process and deliverable review. Can you see here we're doing a maturity assessment and a risk assessment on these different processes? Okay. Then I do it as a change review. So are our people, the people from a change management point of view, are we getting the right people on the bus? Or are the people capable of doing things? Do they have the knowledge, the skills, competencies, and the appropriate attitude or behavior? OK, so that's what I refer to as a change review. Here is what I refer to as our value creation review. So when you look at the data architecture practice, you could look at their metrics in terms of how they're creating value and the goals. OK, and of course, um, our goals would be lagging goals. So we're not going to be able to achieve these goals tomorrow. We, it's going to take some time. So we want to set up some level of leading uh, indicators, for example, standards and compliance ratios. So that, that could be uh, how many standards have we set up and how compliant are we? Okay, so that's, and then we have process quality. So that's going to be around our techniques. How well are our techniques for data architecture? How well have they been defined? How well have they been set up and how, do, how well do we assure them to make sure we're getting the quality out? And then the last one is a technology review. Um, how, how well are we using technology within the organization? Um, OK, and then the last one is when we've done that, I also like to include data strategy. So um, do we have any any swats or issues that um, need to be addressed as far as our data strategy is concerned with respect to data architecture? Um, okay, so here's, there's a question. Yeah, have you had any instances where you're doing an assessment before the participants were aware? Um, and the answer is, uh, I think yes. Uh, and I didn't. I, I hadn't done any training. What I then was required to do is, is I physically had to explain things to them. So it was very manual. It took us in the region of two hours to do it. And, and for every single area, I had to explain what the activity was and what the, what the deliverable meant. Uh, and of course, that slowed things down tremendous. Lots of people got, lots of people got frustrated with the process uh, and they didn't see any benefit uh, in that scenario. So I, I, I battled with that, I must admit. Um, when I didn't do that proper training up front, I, I, it was hard to get through and hard to make people committed to it. Uh, it's a little bit like that change management, for example, if you don't have this um, awareness and desire, then you're trying to get knowledge and understanding from them and they don't really know. But we were we were capable, we were able to do it and, and I can show you some tips and tricks on how to get through that even when you when you start off in a in a in a bad way. OK, so here is here is an example of a readiness assessment, and this was my pre readiness assessment. OK, so I've actually instituted two readiness assessments as part of DMMA. The pre one to say, are our citizens capable of assessing 
And then the post one talks to this situation over here where we're saying, are we ready to achieve our target readiness? So, for example, if, if we come out of an assessment and we, we now need to be at a level three for the next period, we have to ask ourselves the question, are we capable of achieving it? Are we going to be able to do what uh, we've set ourselves up to do? Okay, so the pre-assessment is, um, have the people been selected and notified? Have they been briefed about what they're going to do? Especially when you, when you go and do an engagement with the execs and then they're going to allocate somebody. Um, that's the process of selecting the data citizen. You, of course, you first of all have to get the execs on the page, and then you do the selection and notification and the briefing of the people that are going to do it. Make sure that this project has the appropriate priority so that people know why they're doing it. And then we go through the training, get the right audience, understand their needs, build some uh, flyer for the actual training, and then get a training provider to actually do this for you. Um, you may not be able to do it or whatever it is, or in some cases you will have to do it. Okay, so we then go into what we refer to as a post readiness assessment. Let's not worry about this too much, but here's some details in terms of what you need to look at. Okay, what do you need to look at in terms of people, process, technology, physical resources, and systems within the organization? So here's some uh, template breakdowns of, of doing that assessment or having the appropriate areas to check. Okay. All right, so what I wanted to show you was really just an example, and, and you can use this now as an example for your DMA training for data architecture. Of course, you can use this given that you're using the DMBOC as the reference model. Um, if you're not, um, you would need to do that uh, yourself and build this training yourself. So one of the first things I like to do with training is to be able to describe to the stakeholders what are they going to get out of this thing? What, what is the benefit to them? Okay. Um, so this is the type of thing we do is what benefit does the business unit get from data architecture? And I'd love to love to see any comments in terms of anyone suggesting what would the, what would they suggest? What was the value that they're going to get? You know, the business are going to get from it. Um, and then it's and then it's also important to say which business units are going to be. Uh, involved in the assessment, which business SMEs, which business data stewards, we need to do that selection process. We need to get that right so that when they're attending the training, it's not like, what am I doing here? And um, that's something that we really use uh, Menti a lot for, and we actually preload our answers to say, Are you, do you know why you're here? Do you know why you've been chosen to assess data architecture or whatever it is um, and it's and it's quite interesting to see the responses it, it ranges everywhere from yes um, I'm I, I know why I'm here and I feel I can do it to I don't I have no clue why I'm here and please let me get out of this task <laughs> those are the type of ranges of, of questions and fortunately with Menti being anonymous the people feel comfortable in saying that so it's, it is helpful to open that up and allow people to comment. Then, then we'll have the technical stakeholders. So what I like to do is to say which IT departments should be involved. Of course, enterprise architecture should be there in terms of the assessment. Then we look at data development projects or project management. Are project management aware of how data architecture is integrated into their project? What role they should be playing within data architecture? and how can they benefit and then then it's central services and central infrastructure so do the bi people the central service that's doing bi do they know what they need to get from data architecture if they're doing data modeling as, as a service centralized data modeling or a center of excellence do they need to know how to interact with um with the data architecture team and then as well for example on project management if you're doing a waterfall project, then it's a lot easier to bring in data architecture. If you're doing a agile scrum approach, it's a lot harder. Um, and in some cases, they actually, the preference is over functional development rather than 
uh, documentation or design. So maybe there's some challenges that you have to do with that. Now, all of this goes to answer this, what's in it for me? The people that are going to be answering the assessment, why are they there and, and can they see it working? Okay, so um, what, what I find with, if you look at the data architecture processes, so let's have a look at these two. Sorry, you can see that um, it's established data architecture, evaluate the existing data architecture specifications, develop a roadmap, manage the enterprise requirements within the project and integrate with architecture with enterprise architecture now i'm sure you see these and say well jeepers if i if i'm a data citizen my answer is going to be i have no idea and who cares um so when we look at these good to have you back johan when we look at these business processes uh or, or the dm block processes with respect to data architecture most of them are inapplicable to the data citizen except for this law this one in the middle here right which is manage enterprise requirements within projects so what that is saying is that if we have enterprise requirements that have come from the data strategy or that the data architect is is aware of they should know how to bring this into every single project and a lot of the times we find people achieving data architecture by doing it within business projects and the data architect gets involved there and they bring that list of all of their requirements and they start allocating it to the different projects and they get projects to complete uh, their requirements and then to an extent they would backfill into the um, enterprise data model the data flow the data value chain semantics so an example of this is if i do a, uh, a project in for a business unit and we build a data model the data architect could say all oh, right that works very well let's bring that back into the enterprise data model especially if the enterprise data model doesn't address that area okay so what i do find is that a lot of the times the data citizens can certainly answer these questions all right they can answer the questions of um is data storage is the data storage that we have helping us so uh, i've just got a relational database i don't have a data lake i don't know where to store my excel documents i've got a shared folder that's a nightmare um, and we need help in fixing our data storage uh, another thing is the data structures uh, how can the data structures help me um, how do i bring it in and then of course they can answer business agility so if we get a new a new trend, emerging trend, for example, AI and machine learning, how quickly can the business respond and apply that to their business? Now, this is a goal of data architecture, and if the data architects can't enable that and improve that, well, we haven't got good business agility. And this last step in terms of integrating with enterprise architecture, that would integrate to business architecture, to application architecture, to technology architecture, this is critical for achieving that business agility. So if the business agility is low, then we must know that this integration is not happening with respect to data. Okay, so this is a challenge, you know, uh, where we have processes defined, but lots of the data citizens wouldn't know. I mean, they never, they've never done an evaluation of the existing data architecture specifications. I, I doubt that they would do that. The only time I see that coming into play, for example, is when the data architect builds an enterprise data model for a specific subject area, they would ask for review and sign off by the Data Governance Council, as an example, by the stakeholders. They, they would get involved and we should be reviewing our enterprise data model with uh, all our stakeholders, our data modelers, our business data people, and, and making sure that we're getting value out of that. Okay, so what is it that we need to train? In theory, we need to train, train the processes and we need to train the deliverables. My experience is that it's not that easy to train the processes. Yes, I have a hand up. Saad. Yes, hi, Howard. Hi, everybody. This is Saad Ghadani. I'm just uh, disconnected from the course early morning. <laughs> How are you? Uh, just I, uh, I'm wondering about uh, 
semantic. Uh, now I am lead the team. Uh, they uh, they responsible about data architecture. Uh, yes, right. uh, and we need to approach some deliverables. Right. But I'm just wondering if you you shed the light on the semantics. What do you what do you mean here? Ah, fantastic. I'm I'm glad you asked that. Um, because uh, I'm sure you're one of those guys that did the course, and I'm sure that you noticed in the deliverables on the DM buff semantics doesn't exist. Uh, yeah, if allow, if allow me just for 15 seconds uh, to give uh, my feedback, it's very impressive course. And Veronica delivered it uh, very well uh, away. Thank uh, you. Just, uh, this is a, a ch chance for me to, to, to give my feedback about the course. Thanks, how are you? Thanks, Veronica. Thank you. Veronica's smiling. You see the big smile. We should turn the camera on. <laughs> Thank you, Saad. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so let me, interesting thing, one of the comments in, and, and I'm sure Veronica can comment on, one of the comments in the data architecture is that data architects are responsible for the semantics of the organization. Now, what's really exciting these days is that um, we're actually getting data architects that are changing their name to data ontologists. They actually, they're actually calling themselves a data ontologist. And, they, and, and we know that that semantic level improves as you go from a business glossary to a data dictionary to a data model to a taxonomy to an ontology. So I'm sure you, you saw that. Now, we wanting to get to ontology because the biggest benefit of having an ontology is that machines can read that and we can now start explaining to the machine what the semantics of the organization is. Now, what's really important about that so certainly for yourself is what is a what the meaning is in English may be different to what's important for your business, what's important from an Arabic point of view. So the meanings can change, and so our data architects have to uh, take on that responsibility of assessing semantics. Hopefully, that does that explain a little bit more, Saad, in terms of their role. Thanks, Howard. Thanks. Excellent. So, so they need to focus on the taxonomies. They need to focus on the controlled vocabularies. Almost in a way, the, the best place to go from an ontology, you would take your enterprise data model and start lifting it up into taxonomy and ontology. Now your, your semantic definitions are a lot stronger and you're now getting into a machine readable uh, view as well. So um, let's keep on going and, and we can have further discussions. So, what, what I like, this is my training that I do for data citizens. Okay. All right, so my training is, and I try to get this as simple as possible. This is one of the tricks I used for my business units to say, if you've never heard about this thing, then it's absent. <laughs> so for example, if you've never heard about an enterprise data model, as far as your business unit is concerned, it is absent. And uh, I know the first one we did uh, for data architecture, they didn't have a data architecture department. Most of the, the, the processes and deliverables for data architecture was absent. So we actually got through that one pretty quickly, which, which was a relief. And, and it gave them a way of uh, measuring. And what I'm saying here, and a simple, simple, uh, you know, simple example is, um, if you haven't defined a practice or you haven't given me a policy and a procedure and a way of doing things, well, it's not defined and you can't, you certainly can't tell me that you've got it defined. So if, if I don't know it and I'm not aware of it, well, then we, we, we tending towards the below three level. Now, what may happen, for example, if I'm ad hoc, I may have attended a project and, and someone on the project, uh, I saw someone doing it. So I know that it's been applied. I've never really had the experience, but someone else has done it and, and they've applied the deliverable. But, but I really don't know the five wives and one husband, right? I don't know why I'm doing it. I don't know what I need to do it. I don't know how I need to do it. I don't know any of these things. So then it's an ad hoc level. If it's repeatable, then I'm saying, oh, you know what? We're actually applying it in our projects and we've seen the value and we know why it's important. We see the value of having the consistent, maybe for example, we've done a, a master data domain. 
and we were able to see the value of our enterprise data model. Um, so that was that was very helpful. OK, and then we go into defined where everything has been well defined. Uh, all the practices have been set up and it's been operationalized. So the practices have been established within the business. Now, there should be no reason for business people to say, oh, I don't know what it is, um, unless they've just joined and they haven't gone through the induction. Um, there, there should be no reason. But now, can you notice they know why it's there, they know how, and they know when it should be doing. And we should have what's important, especially in a level three, is a scorecard. If you don't have a level three, if you don't have a scorecard, sorry, then it would be interesting to see why you feel that your aspect is managed, because you need to have a way of scoring the work that you're doing. So you can't just have, oh, shucks, I give it a, a rating of three or four or, or whatever it is. I've, I've got to have a smart metric. I've got to have a smart measure that tells me it's specific, it's measurable, um, and all those, all those other areas of smart, and I know they're smarter as well. If it's managed, then we know that the stakeholders are constantly reviewing and measuring the deliverable, and there's good practices that have been set up. If it's optimized, then they are becoming more efficient, more effective, using the deliverable, and they know um, the best practices for these deliverables. Okay, so this we really know how to do this job well. We we know how to do it. Okay, so this is this is what I this is the way I train right in the beginning. These are the levels. Are you capable of looking at a deliverable and giving me an answer uh, in that situation? That's what I'm trying to, to help them assess. OK, so let me give you some examples of, of the next level of training by deliverable. So here it is. I've got a definition. I don't, I don't really need to read the definition for you, but every deliverable needs a definition. OK, so that we don't get into arguments about is this an enterprise model? Is it a, this model? And we have some level of structure. So, for example, I go to the DMBAC, I get the structure of the enterprise model. It's made up of the conceptual, subject, logical, and within the application, I get the logical and physical. OK, so I understand the structure. I understand the definition. Um, and I like you remember where the definition is always about what does it do? Um, uh, Johan, your question there is, is qualitative and quantitative. I, I do believe you can. I, I actually like that. So, for example, when I'm measuring things that are, are can't be quantified, for example, the value of business agility, um, I, can, I can probably quantify the value of a data asset, but I, I can't always quantify the value of business agility. Um, so then we would be a lot more qualitative in in our in our review on that and it's helpful to to have those levels of qualitative questions within the uh, data management maturity assessment so you pick up a little bit of more of the comments so i have a comment section on my on my um, maturity assessment okay so this is what i do for the enterprise data model i start describing the five wives and one husband so why do i have it well, for my enterprise data model, I want consistency across all the business units. And so this is something for you. It's common meaning and common semantics. And then I have common definition. So I've got a common meaning and a common understanding across all of my enterprise. And I have a common definition as far as the technical. So what's the data type? Um, if it's a national ID, is it 10 characters long? Um, I, I need to have those definitions. And the other thing I benefit from is a master blueprint. So the, so the enterprise model gives us a master blueprint. Um, OK, uh, then I have the what. What are the elements of an enterprise data model? Subject area, conceptual and logical. Who gets involved? The business stakeholders can they? I actually help train them to build the data estate for their business units, which is a subject area model. The technical stakeholders, we talk to the data modelers in terms of how do they pull a view from the master data, from the enterprise data model, to have a starting point within their project. Remember, we said here that 
the logical model starts the logical model within the application. Okay, so they need to know how to build it and bring that um, starting model. And of course, master data people, they want that uh, master. They would love to have an enterprise data model so they don't have to do all the modeling. Okay, when, when do we need an enterprise data model? Well, for business unit subject area models, for the application data model, when we want to create a new data model, and it's either buy or build, and if we buy, then we understand that we may need to reverse engineer the application to give us the model so we can check the business requirement. Or when we change it, uh, where is this done? It's done at a data warehouse level, it's done at an application. So for example, we would have an enterprise data warehouse model in an enterprise data warehouse. We would have a master data domain and how, this is um, our stakeholder definition on that. So. Just to give you an example to try to explain to the people, here is a conceptual model. So business people, data citizens, have you seen a conceptual model like this that describes your business? Um, and then the next one is a master, day, master data domain model with the party model. Have you seen something like this that's describing your data, your master data domains? And, and if they can recognize it to give them an example like that, then they say, ah, okay, now I get it. Now, now I understand what we're talking about. I, I've got an example and I can, I can now score whether we've applied it in a project, whether we've used it, whether we used it to vet an application, whether we've created a master data model, have we created an enterprise data warehouse? Hopefully, I, hopefully you're seeing how, how they can now relate to the scoring of this maturity. Um, Okay, and then of course here is my scorecard. So the data modelers should be well aware of, of the fact that there is a scorecard. And of course, the one that's important for the data architect, of course, all of them are, but the one that's important is how well, how consistent is the model with the enterprise? That's referring to the enterprise data model. Um, okay, now here you can see that I, of course I do all this stuff in Power BI, so I'm actually loading it. Now I would want to see if you're telling me that your data architecture enterprise data model is sitting at a managed or optimized, I'm going to ask you, show me the results, show me how you're assessing it, and then show me the trend. Okay, you can't be at the last two if you just don't have any of this data. I, I should see it available. You know? I, I should be able to go and find it somewhere. So without a data model scorecard, I don't think you in either one, three, four, or five, I, I, I would question whether you're at that level. Okay, now let's go to another, let's go to another example. Here's something called the data flow. You can see a definition. Again, I'm not, I'm not going to go through all the details and there is a structure. So can you see this is sort of an example of how you'd use a data flow within the organization. Notice we're moving the data from source system to data warehouse, to data mart, to the reports. Okay. Notice that at the high level this is at. Okay. It also includes a link to your business process. Okay. So we are saying that data flows can be done at an organization level, they can be done at a capability level, they can be done at an application level. There's different levels for data flow diagram. So here is my uh, five wives and husband. Again, I'm not going to go through all the different areas. This can be used uh, in the deck later on, but notice I may need to produce a data flow for regulatory purposes, for data privacy, Europa, as an example, data provenance. Where am I getting it from? Do I have trust in that situation? An impact assessment, a root cause analysis, data sharing agreement, data exchange agreements, this needs to be visible when you set these type of elements up or you want to create a data sharing agreement, you should have a data flow so people understand how this thing's going to be shared between the parties. And of course, diagramming, we could be doing it as, as a to be. There are data models do have the ability to do a data flow, so we can have that. But from a technology point of view, in terms of Looking at data flows, uh, or sort of, sort of from an as-is point of view, you probably need technology to help you document that. I know we've done it manually before, but it was quite disheartening knowing that it could change as you were doing it. And and these are the examples. So I can have a matrix 
uh, data flow diagram. You can see my business process. I can have a application flow or and I could have a subject area de or a capability dependence model. Okay. So these are the different formats in which you see data flow. Here is the data lineage. Again, the same thing. Um, all I wanted to show you here is that this data lineage is now at a data element level. OK, a data element. So it's a lot more detailed. Um, again, the five wives and, and here is an example. This is from the solid data tool and you can see all the levels of detail as this data is moving right down to an attribute level. And very interestingly enough, you can collapse a data lineage to get a data flow. OK, so you can see here now that when I collapse it all above the elements to a data set level, I've now got a data flow diagram and this is Howard Travers, I, I chat with him a lot and he uh, has a tool called Solidatus. If anyone's interested, we could set up a, a webinar to talk through it. He's got very nice ones from a lineage point of view, uh, sorry, a regulatory point of view. So he's got BCBS, he's got uh, GDPR and stuff like that. So it's, it's nice to bring that in. He brings taxonomies in the background to help him with some of the data lineage. OK, now here's a simple example of a data value chain. OK, so what is a data value chain? It describes a series of steps needed to generate value and useful insights from data. Um, if you want to know more details, the, there's a course on next week about how to build a data value chain. Here is the structure and, and this is this is a simplistic one. It, it hasn't got to knowledge and wisdom. It's really just I collect the data. I then transform the data to information and I deliver the information. OK, and I'll show you some uh, different examples of that. This is why we. Um, why we have the data, the data value chain, we want to create valuable data assets and we want to support a data a customer value proposition. And of course, the underlying deliverables is, is what do we create is data products and data data as a service. These are the different areas that we deal with. Um, certainly to get the as is, you need DII uh, integration to get that right technology. But in the beginning, you could have it to be. So if I want to just get a quick uh, element flow, this is how I would do it. And here are some examples. So you need to have some examples that they can relate to. So, for example, a heartbeat monitoring service. This is the data value chain. I, I get the data source from my heart. I get the heartbeat check device that's collecting the data. It then gives me my heart rate monitor, all the data sets that are there. I can then use that to understand my heart condition. Notice how we're going from data to information. And now I'm getting a valuable proposition back to my customer where I've got diagnostics and, uh, and telling me the possibility of me having a heart attack. And I can get it now through my smartphone. And the value that I get as a customer is a cardiovascular patient uh, and I get better heart condition. OK, simple answer of a data value chain. Hopefully this is making sense and we can describe this to our data citizens. And again, guys, if you haven't got it, and you haven't seen it, then uh, it's probably absent. Here is data as a service. So data architects help set up the service uh, in the cloud. And notice they go through these levels. So we have a detailed data service, then we aggregate, then we visualize, and then we get insights. Um, these are the different people that can provide us with data, social media, IoT, and of course, other different providers. And then I have a consumer. So give me some examples. This would be, for example, a coffee shop. Um, I have coffee, coffee manufacturers that supply me with coffee. I have people that do reviews on Illy coffee or whatever coffee it is. I then also got foot traffic and weather data. I bring all of this stuff together to help us uh, give information on the different manufacturers and I provide a data product. Okay, so that's that was a... Uh, Hopefully a, a, a less intense um, review of data management or data maturity assessment training. How would you train your people? Hopefully that makes sense. Um, Eli likes to take our money. Yes, certainly. <laughs> any any comments? Any questions?
I see there were some comments, Are all the questions answered. Um, yes, so certainly, Johan, that's something we dealt with um, last week in terms of managing. If we were to do, we I think we do need to do risk assessments as part of our maturity. Um, we then need to be able to say what is the risk to the business, depending on the appetite uh, about having a low maturity. Low maturity, uh, for example, that would work out if we don't have a, a common semantics. So we may have bit different business uh, departments in the value chain, in the data value chain, reading and interpreting that differently. So the risk, the risk could be quite big. But it's something that you need to get feedback from the citizens to say, how possible is it that this risk is real? So I always like to do a risk uh, rating. I break it down into the impact and the probability. If the impact is high, fantastic. Uh, and I need to worry about it. If the probability is low, well, I don't really need to stress at this point in time. But that brings my risk rating down. Um, Howard, I have a, a question. Sure. Um, you, you said earlier something interesting about data architects and ontologists. Yeah. And there's obviously a, a kind of a maturity that you have to reach to actually get there. Yeah. Um, uh, and typically, maybe, maybe at least in theory, you'd start with a with a business glossary. But we've also seen how often that is not done. Yeah. yeah. And then it you know progresses from there. But do you think that um, do, do you think there are, sorry, there are instances where you can actually try to jump to something like an ontology before going through some of the other steps? Yeah, you, yeah. I, mean, I, I think we, we've seen that, Paul, in terms of some of our experiences with uh, enterprise data models. Um, for example, with, uh, with Len, Len Silverstone. Um, his universal data models give you definitions everything like that. And they're also now moving or progressing into a business glossary and an ontology uh, movement. So they, they're pushing to that to get that. Unfortunately, that's at a very generic level. So it doesn't, it doesn't always come down to the, the actual business, but, but people are, are moving there to get those ontologies defined. Fibo, as an example, has that ontology. It's got the good definitions. And then uh, Jürgen uh, Zimmer, he took the fiber, created an enterprise data model. He calls it uh, FibDM. Um, that's financial business data model. Now, so there's a good start. So, so there is a bit of a jump, but always we, and I'm sure you've had experiences of that, is we can take these reference architectures, but if we don't make them our own, we, be, we try, we force the business to look like this uh, enterprise data model. And I've seen that happen with the IBM data model. The, what's it? I, oh, yeah. I, yeah, I, I see businesses just taking that thing and saying, everything needs to be compliant with this. And the business people say, what are you talking about? It's like, what, what is this all about? I don't, I don't even know. And they haven't been through that transformation. Johan, I like your question there or your statement about uh, training. Uh, would you see this as being helpful to people in answering the maturity assessment? Yeah, I definitely think so, uh, Marwit. I think the, the also the, the fact of putting examples in front of them takes a little bit of the politics out of the conversation. Yeah. And everybody has an understanding of what they should be looking at and there can't be a lot of arguments. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I was, uh, you know, I, I've done so many of these and, and until sort of today when I was trying to make this explanation of how do you get a data citizen to understand those processes? Um, sorry, and I'm, I'm going through the, these processes here. How would a data citizen understand all of this and how do you ask them to mature it? So I've, and of course I know I, I, I work with Paul as well, we, we're building a, we do a lot in Excel and we're trying to automate some of this thing and, and I keep on bringing in the deliverable. And I found on three engagements, three different engagements to say, if, if, if we couldn't give them an example of the deliverable, the process would be, 
we, we couldn't understand what that process means. So I hope, I hope that's helpful to people and, and I hope they see the value of connecting the deliverable to some of the processes. Well, sorry, did I answer all you, did I answer your question in terms of the ontology jump? Yes. Yeah, it's, uh, <clears throat> it's uh, it remains a topic of interest and um, and and situations where it's actually uh, where we we are where we are able to do it. Yeah. You know, there's always competing funding and so on, but that that's really the cool stuff we want to get to. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Sure, sure. And I and I think if we can almost connect that enterprise uh, data model to the the feeding into a knowledge graph, which which means it needs the 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 meta definitions, the ontology to to link the two together. Um, I think we we get a, a leapfrog there. And I mean there were there were some nice comments I did in my data storage uh, one where where people are saying there's two schools of thought in a data mesh. When I'm when I'm trying to get semantic unification, one one school says let's build it, let's get architects, ontologists to build it. Other school of thought is let's use active met metadata and knowledge graphs and graphs to 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 automatically build it. Um, lots of people say they don't they they don't believe that it can be automatically built. Um, so so I think the 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 jury's still out on that one, but. That whole connection and that whole dependency there is a big thing, and it helps people engage with the AI and machine learning a lot better. Nice. I think it, it was also really nice um, from Pascal Descartes. On Monday, he spoke about uh, bringing uh, the knowledge graph in so he could use a conceptual model and then he called it polyglot persistence and polyglot data modeling with different languages and then he would generate a model depending on the language be it json be it whatever it is he he used that approach and one of the things he was talking about is then enhancing that to handle knowledge graph yeah i actually missed that one i need to catch the recording mm. <clears throat> that was he had a really interesting thing, as he said, uh, and I, I've spent quite a bit of time thinking about it to say, let's start at the document level or the denormalized level, and then let that seems to be the things that people relate to the best, and then we'll go through the process of normalizing. So a nice, a different perspective of, of where one starts with a lot of this stuff. Mm -hmm. But again, we, we would start asking ourselves, how are the data architects helping us in this regard? Because as we know, BI and machine learning can't just jump and start running. They they need that knowledge aspect to it. Mm. Right. Cool. Excellent. Thanks. Thanks. Any any other comments? Any? Uh, I'd love to know from the people that have done assessments in terms of how they get around some of the challenges. <laughs> I know Paul and I have done a few, and each time it comes to, if we just had a decent example or description of the deliverable slash process, then mm -hmm. the result it would be a lot easier. Uh, I think there's 180 different <laughs> or even more deliverables, so it's a, it's a massive job. So you so if you're going to take on the assessment soon and you don't have some of the stuff, you, you're going to need a lot more support from knowledgeable people that can talk to all of the deliverables and give some examples and how people understand. But at the other side, what I like to do is I can give them a small description and an example. If they've never heard about it, you're absent. I think that's it, Howard. Nobody is asking on Menti. <clears throat> it's all good. Thanks again, Howard. Brilliant. Cool. And uh, thanks everybody for joining us today. Uh, remember, just drop us a note and we'll send you the recording if you missed anything or wanted to re-listen. Re and see you next week. Have a good one. Thanks, everybody. Cheers. Cheers, Paul. Cheers.